Okay, good morning. Welcome back, everyone, to BC310 Church and Ministry Administration. Uh, we've been talking about uh, church staff management and we're just uh, interacting around in some questions that uh, our students are asking. Um, I'm just going to go a little forward in our uh, course content and then we'll take up um, any additional questions that that come. So what we were talking about in earlier today in the session was about employee management. Part of that is employee motivation. You know, how do you motivate um, people, uh, church staff, to you know, keep up the good work of just sharing different thoughts? Um, let's go forward. So we also need to address or reduce demotivators. You know, what are the things that demotivate people? Um, one is um, employee turnover. That means when every time somebody leaves the organization, you know, there are people wondering, why is this person leaving? What happened? So on and so forth. Uh, that is true. You know, especially when it's a small organization. If it's a big organization, you've got thousands of people, people won't even know, notice when somebody comes and goes. But in a small organization, uh, you can notice, hey, somebody has is leaving. So what we try to do is, of course, we have to handle this situation very well when somebody is leaving. We just, you know, we celebrate them. That means uh, on their last day of uh, work, we will have a time of, we will uh, we cut the cake we say thank you for your time with us uh we talk about you know what they have contributed to the organization and we we let them share about their experience with the organization and what they're going to do next now of course people will leave for many reasons uh, sometimes people leave because maybe they have a better opportunity somewhere else uh, many times in a church organization people leave because they want to go and start their own ministries uh, which is fine. So we encourage that. So when people want to go and maybe they want to go start a church somewhere, they want to, you know, they want to uh, start uh, uh, their own ministry, we pray for them, we bless them, we send them out. Uh, or sometimes they may go to do the further studies, they want to, you know, study something more, whatever. So many reasons are there. Sometimes they go abroad. So there are people who worked with us and now they're in, you know, other parts of the world. They've gone overseas, they're doing ministry uh, overseas. So, so many reasons, whatever reasons they have, when they leave the organization, we, we try to make it a very pleasant experience. Uh, we, give, we let them share with everyone what they're planning to do, where they're going, so on. So then people realize that when somebody's leaving, it's not a bad thing. It is just that they are moving on into their next phase of their journey and their walk with God, and we can celebrate that. We can bless them uh, as they uh, go. Um, uh, other demotivated is if the workplace culture is very difficult. Uh, what do we? We will talk about workplace culture in another lesson, but. If the workplace culture is very stressful, it's very demanding, it's very authoritative or authoritarian, uh, it's very demeaning, people don't feel good, then that can be a very, it can be a big demotivator. People don't want to work in such an organization. They may just put up with it because they need to get paid or something, but it's not a good motivator. Right? Uh, sometimes reorganization can demotivate people. So, you know, when you're moving people around, it's very discomforting because we all like our own spaces. We all like our, our you know, our quote-unquote comfort zones. But when you want to reorganize and say, hey, we need to reorganize, uh, it, 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 people can get upset. So that's a big demotivator as well. But then you try to do the best you can. Uh, you know, one is you try to explain to people why you are reorganizing it. Hopefully they will understand. Um, Secondly, the people who are being reassigned roles, I, I usually like try to tell them, you know, I try to talk to them first and tell them, you know, look, uh, we are we have to rearrange or reorganize, uh, reassign your roles. 
uh, hopefully you get a buyer. Sometimes they are willing. Sometimes, you know, you have to reorganize and there's no choice because uh, the good of the organization is more important than their personal interests. You know, so somebody may be very comfortable in one role, but then you really need to move them to another role. And maybe uh, the, 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 you know, the outcome is not as it should be, so on. And so you're reorganizing it. Uh, of course, people don't like it, but then sometimes you have to do it for the good of the organization. So that can be a demotivator for some people. Uh, so we have to try and handle it the best we can. Uh, I'm not saying it's always pleasant. It is sometimes difficult, but it has to be done when you're looking at the big picture. Uh, another demotivator can be increased workload. Sometimes if there's too much for somebody to carry, uh, they can feel demotivated. So uh, we try to look at you know, how much work is going on people. We try to uh, uh, distribute the workload. We try to bring in more staff so that they can we have more people to carry the workload. So that's something we'd be very sensitive about. And sometimes people could just be demotivated because of personal challenges. They may be going through things difficulties in their personal life. So this is where, because we are a church, we can also step in and try and address those matters to the best we can so that they're able to do well at work, right? So I just mentioned these because these are, you know, things that we need to be very careful about um, so that people have a, 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 a continue to stay motivated when they work. From time to time, at least once a year, uh, it's nice to do, it's good to do uh, what we refer to as an employee satisfaction uh, or a job satisfaction survey. Uh, I, I will share a sample of that with you. It's just a document where you know you can you can set it up as a Google form and people can fill it up anonymously um, to give feedback on how happy or how satisfied they are. So usually we will do it at the end of the year. Uh, in November, December, so that uh, people can just fill it up and say, you know, this is how I, you know, so we can also learn uh, on, on what areas we have to improve as an organization. It's an anonymous way for people to give feedback, and it's a way for you to know are people happy working in the organization or not. So to get a feedback, it's, it's a good thing. And so I, I will share the sample with you. Maybe I can, I can. Uh, just open the document. Just give me a minute, please. Okay, here you are. Oh, I'm not, sorry, I'm just opening up this. Sample job satisfaction. Let me share it. All right. So, sample job satisfaction. So, this is a Word document that I'm going to, uh, I, I'll upload it. And so, what you can do is uh, this is an anonymous thing. We, we set it up as a Google form uh, where there are these 30 simple questions. Uh, and people can give an answer based on you know uh, a scale one to five they can rate themselves and uh, you know basic question i like to go to work on monday i feel positive uh, i have energy uh, reach work day or energy to do other things uh, my interactions are positive i have good friends at work i feel valued in the firm that work so on right so just general questions i feel i'm fairly compensated, my manager reviews my progress, etc. Uh, and then they and, and so if, if if they get a good rating, uh, that means they have a great job. Uh, if you if you have this rating, you have a good job. I think last year when we did this, um, if I remember correctly, everybody scored within this range. So all our staff scored within uh, these two categories. Most of them were here, 120 to 150. Some of them were here, 91 to 120. So that was last year. So we'll do this again this year. We can see, you know, where where things are, how things are going, and get some feedback. So uh, 
just doing a little job satisfaction survey uh, helps us, you know, uh, know where things are, know where the staff, how the staff are feeling uh, about the organization. Oops, I wanted to share this. Sorry. Let me stop. Yeah, Max, do you have a question? Go ahead. Max, do you have a question? Or maybe not. OK. Let's go back to Christopher, you have a question. Go ahead. Oh, yes, Pastor. Actually, two questions. So one is with regards to uh, staff um, uh, attrition, where uh, staff, um, I mean, have there been cases where staff go to go to other churches or and vice versa in the sense that you know staff who, from other churches who want to who want to work with uh, with this EPC um, has that happened and how how, how was that handled? Uh, that's the first question. And the second one is um, uh, in, with the case of I think we discussed a little bit uh, in some earlier class with, with regards to uh, itiner itinerant uh, pastors. Uh, mm -hmm. You have mentioned I think um, that, that there are already some within APC and I uh, just wanted to understand is you know how does this work is any sort of a support uh, uh, you know model that uh, uh, that sort of uh, you know uh, helps these uh, I, uh, these these kind of pastors mm -hmm. okay good questions so first question um, have any of our staff gone left APC gone to other churches uh, and do other people from other churches want to work for APC? So the answer, answer to both is yes. Uh, we've had people uh, who have been part of APC, church staff, and they some have gone and started their own church, their own ministry. I mean, just um, just before the pandemic, I think 20, uh, 2019, you know, one of our pastors decided to go and start a church so we blessed him and sent uh last year another of our star last year or this year early this year early this year in february another one of our staff wanted to go out and start a, start a ministry so we blessed him and sent him so there are people who from apc would go and start their ministries or maybe would go and work for uh, another christian organization or other organization so that has it happens answer is yes and uh, um, do we have people from other churches applying yeah we have lots of applications from people from other churches uh, who apply you know, because all our job positions are posted on our website we constantly or I think almost every day we keep saving resumes from uh, people from across the country from or from either, even within our city, who are part of other churches. Now, when we interview people, especially when they are part of other churches in our city, when if they're from outside the city, it's okay because they have to relocate. We're not; it won't be a problem. But if they are part of another church in our city, we are very, very careful. You know, because uh, and and all of this will happen in the interview process itself. One is, we, you know, we are careful because we don't want to, we may be interviewing them for a job and then then because of a job, they will feel, sometimes they feel pressure to leave their church and come and work with us and join APC. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want to create an ill feeling between churches just because a person is um, coming to work for us. So we are very careful. We try to handle it very openly. So we ask them, you know, does your pastor know you're applying here? You know, would your pastor be okay? How how are you going to handle this whole thing? If you know, if you're working for APC um, and you're part of another church, or and in some cases, you know, we will require them to be part of the church as well because they, you know, if if it requires that. In some cases, it's not required. For example. Uh, currently, uh, we have, um, I'm trying to think now, we have one person who is part of our media team, 
he is actually a member of another church and he continues to be a member of that church but he is part of our church media team so he works so he uh, as would work he works for us but he's actually part he belongs to another local church right um in uh, uh, there are some and i can think of maybe two people now right now who uh, when they jo when they started working for apc they made a choice to move them and their families to work for apc so that was not something we forced we were fine with them you know we never even talked to them about moving churches we said you know because so one one was in the it department so it doesn't matter for us as long as he works monday to friday you know does the, his it work uh, it doesn't matter to us that he belongs to another church so it wasn't of any issue um, but he just chose to move uh, uh, again another person was part of the media team uh, uh, the only thing was uh, his work involved him, required him to be at location on Sundays uh, uh, that was a video production so it kind of was like a forced thing because of his work he had to you know people so but he's, he's having fun he's enjoying his time here uh, same similarly one of our audio engineers uh, we did not force him we was like hey your, your work involves you to be here on Sunday, but where you go to church is your entirely yours choice. We're not forcing you, and are you okay? And so eventually, he, you know, he's he kind of kind of came in to APC. So it is a very sensitive matter, and sometimes we don't hire people, even if they are good, uh, if it's going to disturb you know, this whole dynamic between us and another church in the city. We feel like, you know, so sometimes, okay, let's not do this because it may affect our relations. So let's not, you know, bring that person on, uh, especially if they're already serving in that church. And uh, uh, if you bring them in to serve at APC, it would kind of interfere with that. So we are very careful. If they're from outside the city, you know, it's not a problem because uh, we are not disturbing anything with their local church. I hope I answered your question, Chris, for the, yeah. The second question, which has to do with itinerant ministers. Yeah, so we have itinerant ministers. Uh, actually, right now we have, let me see, I think two people who are being supported, two or three who are supported this way. That means they are not pastors uh, with APC. Uh, they are more like a uh, traveling uh, they, 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 they travel and minister uh, they have graduated from our Bible college uh, so we know them they studied with us but they're not pastoring they're, they're you know itinerant uh, and yeah one of them you know we've been he graduated with from our Bible college many years ago I think uh, maybe 2008, 2009, something like that, long time ago. So from that time, we've been supporting him every month. Uh, this is just our support financially for his ministry. Uh, whatever he gets, like from his preaching and all that, it's completely his. We don't interfere with that. Uh, we helped him create a legal organization for his ministry so that you know he could have a legal organization and then um, uh, so every month every month we have a online um, pastors meeting that means uh, uh, all, all our APC pastors and uh, itinerant ministers so actually I think we're doing four four people I, I don't know the exact number but I think we're doing four people uh, who are who are like these itinerant you know we just support them and they have their own ministry uh, so we have our outreach pastors that means they have an apc church but we also have people like this who are doing their own ministry but we are supporting them so every month it's usually the third saturday of the month or rather i should say it is always the third saturday of the month we have a online meeting so they can connect with us because they're all across the country and so it's a time for just uh, fellowship and just encouragement and then we keep in touch with them you know, so we not only just give them money, uh, but we also keep in touch. How are you doing? 
he would message me, report to me like this, okay, I'm traveling here, I'm in the city, I'm having these meetings, like that. It's not a, it's not like a, we control them, we don't control them. It's more of a relationship. Uh, we support them and they just share with us uh, progress of their ministry and so on. And then anytime he needs help, if he needs resources, he needs guidance on these people, they would call and we talk to them, encourage them. That's how it works. I hope I answered your question. Ah uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, just on just on the first question, uh, again, this may be a bit sensitive, but in case there are churches, you know, that are that could be questionable, you know, you know, from a doctor or doctrinal point of view, or you know, just on you know how they operate, and if there are staff who want to move from that church to APC, mm. um, you know, uh, again, you know, it's not about you know trying to. Uh, get them uh, to move from their ex existing church but because they really feel convinced that you know that it is it is uh, you know it is not the right place for them to be at and they would like to you know would, would like to work with apc rather than you know be in a church which is uh, which is which is not really uh, uh, you know perhaps christian or you know following following uh, you know with the right principles mm. Um, yeah, that's something uh, I'm trying to think if we have had a case like that. Um, to my recollection at this point, I, I don't think we've run into that situation where, you know, where it's been you know, like what you're saying, they're coming from something that's questionable. Uh, I don't think we've actually, I can't, at least to my recollection at this moment, I, I don't think we've run into that kind of a situation, but definitely we would be careful. We would be careful. Uh, and uh, if there's any doubt, then we wouldn't hire them. You know, we wouldn't hire them because we don't want, to, we don't want them to come in and cause confusion, of course. Um, um, so we would be careful, yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Let me see now. Um, uh, and let's quickly go to the questions in the chat. Uh, Kennedy, do you have elective positions? How do you handle that? And is it biblical? Um, Kennedy, uh, we do not. Like uh, none of our positions are elected. So it's more like, you know, people, church staff are hired based on their skills and capabilities and like we said the interview process um uh, we will talk about volunteers or even volunteers are just selected on their willingness and on their skills and them willing to you know serve so no positions are elected uh, we don't do it is it biblical hmm i haven't thought too much about this but i can just give you my first reaction um i feel that uh, I, I, let me say especially in a church setting in a church or a christian ministry setting i feel what's important is god's selection uh, so god you know god god calls people god anoints people god uh, calls them to certain ministry man recognizes that calling and affirms that calling but it's god who calls people now in the recognition process it's good to have consensus that means it's good to have uh, you know maybe two or three people affirm that hey yeah you are called to this position go for it yeah so that's consensus but i don't like the idea of voting or you know you know saying like okay let's see how many votes this person got i don't like that i'm just giving you my thoughts my initial reaction i haven't like necessarily studied the bible on this whole thing but um my feeling my thought is from my understanding is god calls people man recognizes and affirms that that's it no election or anything like that and it's good if two or three witnesses will affirm that calling you know, that confirms that 
there's a consensus that yeah you're called by God go for it yeah that's my that would be my response um, Maxon, my question is you also fill on the survey form annually uh, Maxon, uh, I don't <laughs> because I set up the questions I don't want to give one fill it up but I don't uh, do that annual survey form Harrison is it possible to work for APC from my country uh, I would say in 2023 Harrison we're going to set things up so that people can do that uh, uh, next year 2023 we will be organizationally ready for something like that at the moment uh, it's uh, I mean uh, uh, people can volunteer but uh, we are not able to send money off we're not able to pay people that's why we uh, we we uh, we can't do that but 2023 we will be able to do it okay Abraham pastor please what are the responses of your first staff what is your advice on having staff before more members come in or wait till more members come in okay so you know uh, uh, just in our journey when we go back to 2001 uh, so uh, in 2001 when we started the church we had no staff it was just uh, like everybody including me we all were, were working as volunteers in 2002 is when we had our first staff but actually this staff was paid by uh, the business so he, he was actually paid by the business but he was giving half of his time for doing church work so he was not he was not like a paid by the church uh, his salary came from the business that we, we had uh, but he was giving half of his time to do church administrative work so our first person whom we had was an admin person who would handle you know the admin work for the church like booking the halls making payments for things all those kinds of you know admin work and he was the first person and uh, uh, church staff but he was like his salary didn't come initially salary didn't come from the church later on he became full-time with the church because uh, it, it required so much of work so much of his time then we moved him so the first person that we hired was an admin person uh, was paid eventually was paid fully by the church his time was dedicated he would handle a lot of admin work for the church then subsequently we had a children's church pastor who was uh, part-time and later on he became full-time so he started off part-time because uh, it was just a little bit of work that we needed for children's church and eventually when it became more he became a full-time pastor then we had um, you know then I think the next person was Pastor Jay Kumar who joined us he's still with us uh, he joined us, Pastor Jekumar joined us initially as uh, 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 the head of administration. He joined us as an administrative officer. And then later on, he moved into more of a pastoral worship pastor role. Um, then we also had, next, we had a youth pastor and a worship pastor join us. So slowly, over time, you know, uh, I would say after four or five years, we had Pastor Jekumar join us, then the youth pastor join us. Like that, so it we, we built gradually over time. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Kennedy. How do you handle succession plans in the events of death? Because I see churches die too when the leader dies. Good question. So this is part of what we uh, we will be talking about it later but I'll just mention it very briefly so very important as a leader is you need to organize in such a way that the ministry can be independent of you right so uh, you need to raise up many leaders around you right and then uh, the goal is to make yourself no longer needed in the ministry of course you're going to be serving God as long as God gives you life on earth of course you're going to be serving God you're going to be faithful but you got to create the organization in such a way that even if you are not there 
things will go forward, continue forward. Right? So that's your goal as a leader, as a pastor. And the sooner you accomplish that, the better it is. Now, it's not easy to do, right? So for example, today, we are 22 years into, or 21 or 22 years since we started APC. I'm still leading, I'm still doing many things, but at least we are in a better place. That means there are more leaders around us and different levels. So there are our pastoral team, then there's a next level of people. Uh, you know, they are they're typically they're serving now as youth pastors, teen, pastors of teen churches, and there are others who are going around preaching. I've intentionally, they're like, like intentionally nurturing, nurturing them. And there's one more level below them of people that I'm intentionally nurturing. So I usually will call them up to uh, to do the declaration on Sunday. You know, they'll come, uh, I say, I'll give you three minutes, you come and do the declaration, they'll come and do it. But actually, these are leaders that we are preparing for the future. So there are three levels of leaders at the moment that are being prepared. So that uh, the, the idea is, if I'm no longer there, at least there are three levels of leaders after me who've to some extent been prepared um, and um, and that's how we're working right so uh, not all of them it's not in a mature state right now but I hope that within the next five years all these leaders will be in a mature place and then in five years I won't be needed you know, um, uh, that means everything at APC can go on without me. It doesn't mean I'm going to go away. I will, I will serve to the best I can as long as, you know, I'm there. But the idea is these leaders will be mature. They will be in a better place. And if there's a need, they will be standing. And, and we're talking about three levels, right? So, so even if the first level has to retire, there'll be another level who will move up. And in fact, my, my, my goal is that at some point, and I, I had planned that, uh, 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 so this, I had shared this plan with the church, with the church, maybe, I forget which year it was, in 20, um, 2011 or 12 or something. I shared that, that, you know, in the next 10 years, we should, we will have all these leaders in place that, so that, uh, you know, uh, 10 years from now, I can move out and actually hand over the leadership. So I don't need to be leading anymore. Uh, the next level of leadership, that means today these people will be in their, you know, maybe in their uh, early 30s. They will be, you know, in a position to take over, that I can just hand it off to them. So that means they will be more closer to their 40s uh, and they will be ready to take over leadership and they can lead for the next 20 years. So that's the plan. So, it's you know, I can step aside. Does it mean I will stop serving God? I will still serve God, but not as a leader. I will just serve God without the role of a leader. But the role of a leader will be given to somebody who has been nurtured, who will be in their, you know, somewhere around their 40s. They could be a little younger or a little older, it's okay. But they have been nurtured and they will take over the leadership. And I can be on the side just serving under them. So that's what we are working towards. So the plan is, you know, so we have to work like that as leaders. And we will talk about it later towards the end of the course. That you need to plan so that you're raising up three levels of leaders after you. Uh, it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. And so you have to nurture them, give them responsibility, talk to them, and nurture them. Now, always nurture a group of people. So for example, you know, right now we call them youth leaders. I've, I've picked out about 12 to 15 of them. They're all in their 20s. Uh, whom that's the third level you know and and we give them small things they come and do the declaration and they carry small small responsibilities but they're all in their 20s but we're nurturing them because the whole group because some of them may leave right they will get married they will move somewhere else or they may get a job some other part of the world they'll go so you need to have a group because not all of them will be there uh, 
10 years from now, 20 years from now, because, you know, various things in life will cause them to move. But you do your best to nurture all of them, and then whoever stays, you know, they will step into those leaderships positions. If they go to different parts of the world, they will serve God wherever they go. So nothing is lost, nothing is wasted. I hope I answered your question. It's okay. All right. Okay, so let's see where we are now. Um, um, hold on, dear. we were doing this. Okay. Okay, well, let me just finish this and then we will close for today. So uh, there's a, also an annual planning document. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's basically uh, a document that people fill up. Uh, so we do this usually in November, December every year. Um, so people will fill this document up uh, and it will be reviewed by whoever is overseeing them. And they, they review themselves for the previous year, uh, sort of for the, for the current year and they plan for the next year. So we let each one do it, and then whoever is their team leader will review it and you know discuss it with them. Um, we do regular review meetings. So with the pastors, I usually connect. So we do have a pastoral team meeting, which is more of a group meeting once a month. But then I will meet one-on-one -on -one with them uh, typically once a month. Sometimes I might miss my monthly meeting because there are so many pastors, so many people. But generally, uh, I, I will meet with them once a month, if def but definitely within every two months. So I talk with, you know, we, we talk about what's happening in the area of ministry and so on and so forth uh, to review progress. Um, if there are underperforming employees, that's a challenge. Um, we we will have to, you know, uh, uh, I think we, I talk about this a little later. Uh, we will have to give them feedback. We have to find out what is causing them to not perform, to not do well. Uh, we just try to help them perform. Maybe they don't have the tools. Maybe they're not motivated. Maybe they're in the wrong place. Maybe they don't have the skills. You know, try to help them. I identify why they're underperforming. Try to address it. Uh, if, and then we have to, you know, at some point we may have to terminate them if they're not changing, if they're not improving performance. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, when there are difficult matters, very important, have face-to-face -face meetings. So when somebody is not doing things the way they should be doing, uh, try not to address it through an email. Try try not to address it through a phone call. Best is to try and address it in a face-to-face -face meeting. Now, if a face-to-face -face meeting is not possible, then you'd look at the next best option, which may be you know, an online video call or a phone call. And an email would be, of course, the last option. Okay. The reason is, uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting, you, you can hear them out. They may be able to explain. Maybe you know we misunderstood them. Maybe they, we don't know what are some of the challenges they're going through at that time. So it's always good to have a face-to-face -face meeting to address difficult situations. You know, somebody didn't do something right. Somebody didn't, you know, depending on the seriousness of the matter. But let's assume there's a difficult matter. As far as possible, sit face to face, talk. Let them share their thoughts. Listen. Do more listening than talking and uh, try to understand what's going on and then you address the matter uh, if you know and then so the email or an, an indirect approach is always the last approach um, but after the after the face to face meeting then important is to put everything in writing because uh, to say that you know this is what we discussed this is what we agreed to this is what you said you will do this is the time frame in which you will do it now put it down in an email so address the matter in a face-to-face -face meeting, but document everything, what was discussed in an email, so that nobody can say, oh, I forgot, I didn't know, it wasn't clear, things like that, you know, which generally happens. So uh, discuss it with the person, put it in 
writing. Okay, maybe I will stop here. This we'll get into next week, uh, talking about how to develop uh, employees and so on. I don't want to force too much today. So we just covered uh, actually just one part, which is employee management uh, in these two lectures, how to motivate them, uh, addressing demotivators, and just a few other things in, in working with staff, okay? Um, and I know we did a lot of question answers today. Um, is everybody okay? Everybody's following? Everybody's getting these ideas? Any questions before we close? Okay, Sri Kumar, please go ahead. Uh, sir, I just want to know that uh, what it means, uh, put everything in writing once again, can you explain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's say, suppose, you know, um, I, I, I have a personal meeting, face-to-face -face meeting with one person. Uh, we discuss, you know, I address the matter. I say, hey, you know, um, you said you will get this, you will do these things, it's not done, or whatever, whatever the difficult situation was. Why did you treat that person like that? Or what? why did you interact with that person? And whatever, the difficult situation, we address it. We talk, they share their ideas, we share. Then we agree to certain things. We say, okay, you know, um, you, you know, see, we will not be able to accept this kind of behavior. Um, so you need to change, and this is what you will do, so on and so forth. So we agree to it, and then we agree, you know, we say, okay, in the next three months, you're going to do these things. We agree. So whatever we have discussed verbally, we need to put it in writing. That means put it in an email. And so usually I will send them an email and copy our HR person, or the HR person may be in the meeting. So the HR person may write the email and you know, send it to them and copy me. Uh, that means basically we are writing, documenting what was discussed in an email so that everything is recorded and nobody forgets. Uh, what we have agreed to. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Employee management. Christopher, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Pastor. So just, um, I guess, a question with regards to, you know, over the last uh, uh, 21 years, uh, in, in, the, in the area of staff development, um, you could just maybe just at, at a high level just you know let us know what are some of the one or two points that you think um, really worked well and you know one or two points that you know you think may have may have been um, detrimental to you know to, to close the church if there was any i mean i just uh, something for just the learning exercise for, for us so uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you just provide us some um, some insights in that Mm. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, I must admit that, you know, the last 21 years has been a learning process. Like, uh, whatever I'm sharing with you today, I did not know 21 years ago, right? I, I had no idea <laughs> because they never done it before. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can't learn these things in management books. I mean, some things, of course, are general management practices, which you can learn, but uh, you can always read it in books, but when you're actually doing it in practice, that's a totally different uh, experience. So, and then, then, you know, to do it in a church context, to do it in a Christian setting, you know, is, uh, is just something very different. And so, uh, I have to say that I did not know whatever whatever I know today. I definitely did not know 21 years ago uh, when we were starting, and uh, when we were growing. I didn't know. I made a lot of mistakes. Like for example, today I'm telling you, have face-to-face -face meeting. I made mistakes. I, I fired people on emails. I fired some of our staff by just sending them an email. You know, and that was it was so so bad it was a big mistake i made uh in the early days in the early days i thought okay i'll just send them an email saying hey your work is not good i've given you three warnings it's over now fired 
but it was bad. I should not have done that. You know, so I made those mistakes. So today I can tell you, a do face-to-face -face meeting first, email is the last resort. Why? And the reason I say it is because I made those mistakes, and it it was not good. Anyway. Uh, so honestly, uh, you know, today we may sound very nice and telling you all these nice things, but I can tell you I made a lot of mistakes in these 21 years and I learned many of these things uh, the hard way. To, when it comes to, you know, the staff development and, and, and I just the good and the bad, uh, just one or two things if I were to pick out. I think the bad, or let me say the good thing. The thing that really I, I feel is, you know, just my observation, just my learning in the 21 years in the church setting. The thing that I uh, that I feel really motiv <clears throat> motivates people is uh, when they are empowered, when they are given the freedom, uh, when they're given ownership of their area of ministry you know uh, we say like look you're in charge you go for it we'll back you know we support you encourage you, you know? so i i see that then they're really motivated they're really excited they can do it and so i see that I've, or at least i see you know when I'm, you're in charge you go for it you whatever ideas we'll encourage you go for it so now when we give it to their hands and then say okay yeah go for it that really motivates them and they make the effort to learn new things, explore new things, come up with new ideas and say, hey, we can do it like this, we can do it like that. And, uh, you know, they they basically are develop themselves, they stretch themselves, they acquire new skills, they come up with new ideas. And so that's one side. But sadly, almost in contrast to that, I see also complacency. That means, the, and this is the dangerous side. The dangerous side is people become very complacent. That means they are like, okay, uh, I just do my little thing, and we have to keep pushing them, keep pushing them. That becomes so difficult. And it's a very, very difficult thing. So on the one hand, there are people, uh, you give them ownership, and they are really excited. They just, just go all out for it. On the other hand, you also find people who become very complacent uh, and you have to keep pushing them, you have to keep thinking for them, you have to keep prodding them. And that I feel is a big problem. Now they are good people, I'm not saying they are not good people, they're good people. They love God and they love, they love, they love God, they're good people. But it's just that there is no fire, there's no motivation, there is no drive as opposed to this. Now you've done the same thing for both. You know, you've entrusted the ministry to them, you are empowered them, you're saying, go for it, I'll back you up. And you find both these kinds of people. And this complacency is a very difficult thing to deal with because you can't find fault with their character. They're good people. You can't find fault with their love for God. They love God. It's where they just miss this missing the fire to take things forward, and that that's a challenge. Yeah, I would say so. These are just one or two. And of course, there are a lot of other good things and challenges are there, but I just mentioned these two. Okay. Um, thank you for all your questions. Thanks for the interactions. Uh, uh, we will continue this next week. Uh, talking about church staff management. And the next lesson after this is on volunteer management. That's again a very big area. And there are a lot of, you know, difficult sides to that in, 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 in managing volunteers. Uh, how do you take care of them? How do you motivate them? You know, motivating volunteers is, again, it's not the same as motivating staff, church staff. Uh, and so that's a totally different area which we need to look at and we'll talk about. Uh, next week. Okay, let's close in prayer. Uh, may I request somebody to please pray and then dismiss us.
Anybody can pray. Still can I pray? Go ahead. Thank you. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day which you have given to us, God. Once again, we thank you for the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, what we received today. We pray that, Father God, none of these words of Father God, Lord Master, lost from us. But, Father, we pray, help us to preserve it, O Lord Master, in our life, in our heart, in such a way that, Father, when we move ahead, Father, let these words be an inspiration. These words enlighten our understanding. Let these words of Father God sharpen our knowledge and wisdom of Father God. We once again thank you, Father God, for using your servant. We thank you, Father God, that your Holy Spirit is preparing each one of our heart to build your kingdom. Once again, we ask you that cover each one of us under your precious blood. And Lord Master, strengthen us so that we can able to build your kingdom. Lord, the way how you are planning, oh Father God. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. I have a good weekend. Um, yeah, I'll see you soon. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.